There are days when I have felt so low. Days where I could be smiling, but desperately holding back the tears. You know that feeling. That feeling where you're low on energy, where it seems like you could sleep all day. Everything, everywhere is going wrong all at the same time, and there looks to be no light at the end of the tunnel. It's in those days where I want to encourage you to begin speaking. Don't let the devil get you down and remain silent. Begin speaking. I began speaking and saying, I declare that I will experience God's faithfulness. I will not worry. I will not doubt. I will keep my trust in Jesus Christ. I will keep my faith in Jesus, knowing that he will not fail me. There have been days when it's been tough, when it's felt like the very ground I stood on was sinking. But I have been encouraged by his word. The word that tells me that his word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. So I began speaking victory because God is directing my steps. And even though I may not always understand how, even though I may not know when, I know that my situation is no surprise to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know what he does? He's meticulous in his planning. He's a God who will work out every detail in my advantage. In his perfect timing, I am assured that everything will work out for my good. So I encourage you to make a statement, make a declaration, and stand by God's word. Psalm 16 verse 8 says, I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. In other words, this verse is saying, I always keep the Lord in front of me, ahead of my every step, in front of my every move. I will always let God go before me because so long as he is by my side, then I cannot be shaken. Other translations of this verse says, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. The key part here being, keep your eyes on God. Keep your eyes on Jehovah. And you may ask, how often? But as the Bible says, keep your eyes on the Lord always, continually, consistently. It means if all is well with me, my eyes are on Jesus. If I am struggling and can't seem to find a way out of the mess I'm in, then my eyes are still on Jesus. Whether the economy is good or not, my eyes are on Jesus. Whether my friends are there or if they have abandoned me, my eyes are to always be on Jesus. Examine yourself and check. Where are your eyes fixed? What are you focusing on? And let's not take God's goodness for granted. Let's not act like he is not worthy to be praised and adored always. Because imagine, if the Son of God never took our sins and hung on a cross, then where would we be? If he never shed his precious blood, who could have saved us? It's something that is difficult to imagine. What would have become of me if God Almighty didn't extend his loving arms and call me to repentance? What if God never loved the world so much to give his only begotten Son? That would be unthinkable. But praise be to the Most High because I am saved, sanctified, and redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. There is no better time to praise God than right now. And I praise Him because if it wasn't for Jehovah Jireh, who would provide for me? 
If it wasn't for El Shaddai, God Almighty, who would save me? If it wasn't for the Lion of the tribe of Judah, who would be my protector? You see, there is no life without Jesus. So I encourage you to fix your eyes on the Holy One. Can I take a moment to tell you about my own personal revelation? In Matthew 19, verse 21, Jesus said the following words, If you want to be perfect, go, sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When I came across this, I received the message that I am to leave certain things behind, which are of no benefit to me in my walk with Jesus. And it's not just a case of leaving anything for the sake of it. I believe it's leaving those things which compete or rival God for your heart. For some, it is indeed money and material possessions. For others, it's a private sin. And for me, I had to look deep at what was holding me back. I had to find those things and really say, I'm leaving you behind so that I can follow Jesus. Anything draining and everything toxic had to go. Any bitterness from the failures of the past, all the hurt and the pain, I had to leave it all behind. Every disappointment, every wrong decision, it all had to take its place behind. And yeah, the devil has tried to condemn me. He's tried to remind me of all the times I've fallen, all the times I've come up short in sin. He's tried to plant thoughts of doubt and discouragement, but I know he is an accuser. And I know that I have confessed my sins. I've repented it and I've asked for forgiveness and I have been forgiven. I have been set free. Those doubts, those sins, those times I've fallen short, I'm leaving it all behind. And I'm not talking about living a life of perfection. I'm talking about striving for a life of progression, progressing from my old ways, progressing in my pursuit of a stronger relationship with God progressing with a deeper understanding of the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about everything on a new level. My prayer life has to be different. My faith has to be stronger and bolder. My worship has to be different. The God in me must be seen outwardly. Even my personal prayer list, my goals, I'm asking big, I'm believing big, and I want to encourage you to do the same too. Start that business believing that God will make it work for you. Study hard and take school seriously, believing God for all of the skill, wisdom, and knowledge you need. Take your marriage to another level, believing God for a complete turnaround. If it's a job or your finances, tell God about it and believe He will make a way. If it's your health and you need healing, tell God about it. If you're stuck in some bad circumstance, tell God about it. And if you're encouraged, that's good. But that's not to say you won't come face to face with challenging tests. But even so, don't get distracted. Don't get discouraged. Don't quit. Don't waver to the left or to the right. God's not going to leave you out to dry. He won't leave you alone. But like the book of Joshua chapter one says, have I not commanded you be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God is with you, so keep your eyes on him and look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Could it be that the reason for this difficulty is God wanting to reveal to you how real he is? That he is the great I am? That Jesus Christ can still perform miracles on this earth today? See, if we learn how to change our perspective, if we learn to walk by faith and not by sight, if we open our spiritual eyes and change the way that we see things, then our mind truly changes. As a man thinks, so is he, the Bible says. So what happens when instead of asking, when will things turn around for my good, we start asking, what do you want me to learn in this, Lord? What happens if instead of speaking about the negative only, I begin to think on those good things that are promised in the Bible. If I begin to think on all those great things, even though I feel like everything is going wrong in my life, imagine how uplifting that will be for your faith. I can look at the fact that I know who I have in my corner. 
I know his power. I know that he who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. All I have to do is call out to Jesus and he's right there with me because the Bible tells us that the Lord is a stronghold, a very present help in the time of trouble. But the unfortunate thing with many believers is that during a storm in their life, they are so focused on the clouds being great. They are so focused on the thunder and lightning, so focused on the rough waters tossing us to and fro that we forget who's on the boat with us. We forget that the one who is on the boat with us has the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And this is not to overlook anyone's situation. There are difficult things that people go through and I know it may be very hard sometimes, but I would like to encourage you to change your mindset, shift your perspective, activate your faith, and see that the Lord wants to get the glory out of your life. He wants his glory to be able to shine off of you. Your trial will be a testimony for others to see how they can make it too. And the word I'd like to give you is that you are already equipped with what you need in order to survive this. You are already equipped with what you need in order to overcome this. You have what it takes. You have more than enough. So start declaring that you are an overcomer. You are more than a conqueror. Your physical eyes might not yet see it, but activate your spiritual eyes and declare God's word which says that I've overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of my testimony. There is power in the blood of Jesus and his plans are for you to prosper. They are plans which are good to give you a hope and a future because you are that important to God. Begin to see the worth in your life through God's word. God is trying to tell you, yes, you are that important. You can overcome if you hold on to me if you hold on to my word and promises. I believe that when God said, I am who I am, he was saying, regardless of the situation you're going through, regardless of the need, regardless of the desire, I am that, which you need, meaning that everything I can ever need can be found in God. I love that Jesus used the words, I am. He didn't say I was, I will be, I am becoming. He simply spoke in the present tense and said, I am. Meaning that he is what he says he is. I am your healing. I am your peace. I am your protection. I am your help in the time of trouble. I am all the comfort that you need. I am your way maker. When there seems to be no way, I am your provision. I am Jehovah Jireh, your provider. Jesus Christ still says, I am today. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the solution. I'm the way where there seems to be no way. I am your salvation. I'm your confidence. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is all that you could ever need. When we call upon the Lord our God, He works in mighty, mysterious, and perfect ways. Whatever you need can be found in God, but everything really hangs on what you believe. God is well able to deliver you, well able to perform a miracle, but you have to make the choice to believe in Him. Now there is one I am statement which is intriguing to me. In John chapter 15, verses one and two, Jesus spoke these words. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Jesus Christ said, I am the true vine, and I believe that you, refers to the branches. He is referring to the true believers who by faith have an interest in and a union with Christ. These are the branches of the vine here spoken of. If the Lord were to examine your every action right now, your every deed, your thoughts, and all of your intentions, what would he find? 
would there be evidence that you were producing good fruit? My fellow brothers and sisters, we have to realize that it's important that we as believers, as born again children of God, abide in Christ. The Son of God says, he who abides in me bears good fruit. Now, I for one take this very seriously. God isn't playing with us when it comes to us abiding in him and producing fruit. He isn't playing because he sets out a clear marker. He draws a line and says, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. God's not playing with us. So what kind of fruit are you producing in your life? Are you connected to the true vine? Are you abiding in him? Our God is good, yes indeed. He is compassionate and loving and kind. But he is not to be mocked. You are either producing fruit or not. And whichever side of the coin you land on, there are conditions and consequences. This challenged me to my core. How am I living? How does Jesus, the true vine, see me? God must be reverenced and recognized as a holy God. Stop mixing him. Stop holding the Bible with one hand and holding the world in the other hand. We can't be half in and half out. There is no sitting on the fence. You're either a branch that bears fruit in Christ, meaning you're a Christian who is hot, on fire, and burning for the Lord, or you're the opposite, a branch that has been cast out and withered. A branch connected to Christ, the Word of God, that's our food. Matthew 4 verse 4 says, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. A believer connected to the true vine is fed the word of God. And one of the fruits that the word of God produces is faith. Because the Bible says in Romans 10 verse 17, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Do you see how it all comes together? And we can go further to say that a branch connected to Christ must meditate on the word of God so that they can grow their faith. Because without, without this fruit of faith, it's impossible to please God. I need you to understand the importance of this. So let's sum up some key points about what good fruit looks like in a believer. A Christian who bears good fruit in Christ loves the Lord their God with all their heart and soul. They also love their neighbor as they love themselves. A Christian who bears good fruit in Christ will be in the world, but not of the world. That's why we are called to come out from among them, to be separate and set apart. It's because we bear good fruit, and good fruit is not to be contaminated with this world or with sin. So if Jesus said, I am the true vine, every branch that abides in me shall bring forth good fruit. If he said that, then how can we speak the name of Jesus, claim to be walking with Jesus and living for Jesus? How can we do all these things? but not be bearing good fruit. This is why the Bible says, Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. In nature, from a vine, we look for grapes. And so from a Christian, we look for self-control, a godly disposition, forgiveness. A branch that abides in Christ should demonstrate what Galatians 5 verse 22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All of these refer to your spiritual life, the fruit you should be producing. People of God, I urge you, we must have works of grace and works without corruption. And the more fruit we bring forth, the more we abound in what is good, the more our Lord is glorified. In order for you and I to be fruitful, we must abide in Christ. We must have union with him by faith. Now the second part of John 15 verse 2 says, While every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. God prunes. He pays attention to the development of that branch. Meaning that God has ordered your footsteps. He's done it all so you can produce more fruit. God has ordered your trials and experiences, good or bad, easy and tough. He's ordered the time you will spend in the fire. He has ordered your time on the mountain and in the valley. He's ordered a season of waiting 
and he has ordered a season of abundance. He has ordered your times of conflict. He has ordered everything so that you might bear more fruit. He wants to shake off that past of yours. He wants to shake off that bitterness, which can still be traced on the edges of your heart. He wants to remove that person you are still holding in a cage of unforgiveness. He wants to prune you, to mold you and shape you into a vessel that he can use for his kingdom. So you may be going through something and asking, God, where are you? But may I tell you that the steps of a good man, the steps of a good woman, those steps are ordered by the Lord. Man, God is up to something, my brother. God is up to something, my sister. This season of trial and difficulty you are enduring, God is up to something. This time in the fire, this time in the lion's den, God is up to something. He is working on you and he's working within you. You've got to understand that God is not into your gestures. He's into your heart. He's interested in your motives. He wants to know your intent. He wants to know that you place his will above your will. He doesn't just want the words you speak, but he wants to take up residence inside the chambers of your heart. He doesn't just want the hallelujah you shout, but he wants you to rely on the joy of the Lord as your strength. So hear me, God is up to something in your life. You are going through this test so that you can produce even more good fruit. Seek him first. Don't mix him up with other ungodly things. Your footsteps have been ordered, so don't think anything happening to you is an accident. God is in control, and he will continue to be. Our part is simply to remain connected to the true vine that is Jesus Christ. you ever found yourself fixated on something? Your prayer request is all about that next blessing. It's all about a bigger breakthrough. As believers, so often we cry out, fix it, Jesus. But do we cry out with the same passion and intensity the words, thank you, Jesus? What you're about to hear from Nadine Raphael is a call for all of us to turn our thanksgiving into thanks living. Live a life that is thankful during the good and the bad, give thanks. By all means, cry out to the Lord, fix it, Jesus. But don't ever forget to also cry out, thank you, Jesus. The scripture commands that we praise him. It commands the believer to give praise and thanks to God. Paul said men ought to always give thanks. That's what Paul says. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, In everything give thanks because it is God's will for you. Romans 1.21 lets us know that it's actually evil to be unthankful. Psalm 118 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Why? For he is good and his mercies endures forever. Throughout scripture, we see that thanksgiving was a part of life from the Old Testament to the New Testament. We see that with the children of Israel, it was actually a law. It was an offering in Leviticus 7 to be made unto the Lord. We see that with the, with the Philistine battle when they came back from battle in 2 Samuel 22, where they offered a thanksgiving of praise unto the Lord. We see that in the dedication of the temple with Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 8 as he made a sacrificial thanksgiving unto the Lord. But even more than that, Jesus models thanksgiving. The bread of life, every time he broke bread, you know what he did? He gave thanks. I know now today we call it grace. Not for Jesus. He gave thanks. The bread of life was given thanks for bread, for, for earthly bread giving thanks there's there's something about giving thanks that's supposed to echo in the life of the believer and yet we find believers having something always to complain about the sin of the children of israel 
It wasn't that they were, you know, a, a, a large group. It was that they were always complaining. They complained about everything. And the scripture says that we ought to always give thanks. Now, when she said Romans 1.21 lets us know that it's actually evil to be unthankful, I had to look at myself more closely. That scripture reads, For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Now, I don't wish for my heart to be darkened, especially because of not being thankful. So we should always, always give thanks and be thankful. This next segment is all about the story found in Luke 17 about the 10 lepers. Now, as you listen, pick out the lesson here. 10 lepers all had a fix it Jesus request, but how many had a thank you Jesus attitude? Here's Pastor Nadine. There are 10 lepers, the village where they're staying, it's a nameless village. The scripture doesn't tell us the name of the village. Jesus, they were not on Jesus's agenda. The scripture says that Jesus was on his way to Samaria. And on his way to Samaria, he's passing through some, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Jerusalem. He's passing through Samaria and Galilee and tucked in between Samaria and Galilee is this nameless village. And this would have been an ordinary day for these 10 lepers, except Jesus was coming by. It was their ordinary day. You know, these lepers, they were outcasted. They were shunned. They had nubs of their extremities. The leprosy, the disease, which had no cure at the time, would have been eating away at their flesh. Boils and sores and open sores would have been all over their bodies. They would have been weak and, and lame and, and they, were, they were shunned by society. Who knows the last time they saw their children, their family, their spouses. Because society made sure that they stayed away from everyone else, the normal people. And everywhere they went, they had to yell out, unclean, unclean, as if having the disease wasn't bad enough. They had to make everyone know they had the disease. Their skin would have been white like snow. So they tried to cover it so that people wouldn't see. And so here they are tucked away in this nameless village on a regular day, on an ordinary day. And Jesus is walking by. The scripture says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The message translation says, and the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. In the neighborhood of their situation, here comes Jesus. In the neighborhood of their leprosy circumstance, here comes Jesus walking through. And I'm sure that in this village, there were other people that needed healing. There were other people that had circumstances. But these 10 lepers seized the opportunity because Jesus was walking by. In the neighborhood of their situation, here comes Jesus. That's a powerful word. And how many of us desire for Jesus to just walk by us? How many would love to have the master pass by the doorstep of their home or by the doorstep of their situation? But here's the thing. The Lord always makes himself available, but it's down to us. It's down to our actions, our hunger, our desire to seize the opportunity. Like Pastor Nadine said, the lepers probably weren't the only people that had problems in the village. They in all likelihood weren't the only people with issues. But in this encounter, they were the only ones who had that drive and hunger to seize the moment and pursue Jesus of Nazareth. So I encourage you to do that too. Don't allow Jesus to pass you by without being heard. Don't allow the master to walk by your village, your neighborhood, and not touch you. Now, as we dive back in, really pay attention to her description of why the lepers couldn't afford to just let Jesus walk by and not be seen. And as he's walking by, leprosy would have attacked their larynx and their vocal cords. So the scripture doesn't say they shout. They lifted their voice because they couldn't scream. And here goes Jesus, and they see him at a distance. See, they heard about this Jesus. This is the Jesus that when blind eyes were shut and he came by, he gave them sight. This is the Jesus that spoke to lame feet, and they will begin to walk again. 
This is the Jesus that speaks to possessed individuals and they were set free immediately. Oh, they had heard about this Jesus. And here he comes walking by. And these 10 seize the opportunity. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And if you would be wise, you would say the same thing tonight. Jesus, Master, have mercy. You see my situation? Come into my neighborhood, Jesus. And Jesus didn't even stop. He looks over at them, the scripture says, and tells them, go show yourself to the priest. What manner of man is this? He didn't stop, he didn't spit on them, wipe them, he didn't tell them to lay down, stand up, go dip in the Jordan seven times. He just spoke. And the scripture says, as they were on their way to the priest, boils were disappearing. White skin was turning to, to healthy flesh. That which was rotten away began to, began to be restored. Who is this man, Jesus? The miracle work and wonder. And here we go, we see them walking away. And as they are walking away, one saw it. You see, to see, be a thankful person, you gotta be able to see the goodness of the Lord in your life. You got to be able to count your blessings. You got to be able to think about the, the, all the things that God has done for you. The, the, the things that he delivered you from. The car crash that he stopped. The, all the things that you could go through. The, the mindless issues that you were having when you didn't have peace at night. But God has given you sleep now. The marriage that he turned around. The illness that he brought you out of. The situation that he did. You got to be able to see it, church. And give thanks this man he saw it but he not only saw it mm -mm. as they were walking because Jesus told them go show yourself to the priest so they're being obedient to Jesus but as he starts looking at himself he said mm -mm. hold on hold on hold on I know the master said to go show myself to the priest but I just can't walk away from what he's done for me I got to go back to find this man. I got to go back because he saved my life. You see, Chris, he covered you from that car accident. That even though you went through something, God picked you up out of that bed. You got to go back and give God thanks for all that he has done for you. So the Bible says, you not only have to see it, but you have to say it. So he goes back to say what? You can imagine all the things, all the feelings that he was feeling in that moment. He didn't know how to reconcile what he was feeling, but I guarantee you two words came out of his mouth. Thank you, Lord. I don't know how you did it for me, but thank you, Jesus. I don't know how you delivered. I don't know what you did. I don't know what kind of power you have, but Lord, I thank you, Lord. Because no one could have done it like you, Lord. No one could have healed me like you. No one could have delivered me like you. So, Lord, all I have is a thank you, Jesus. You need to look back. And truth be told, you don't have to look far. Because right now, today, you have something to be thankful for. And I know you got up this morning and you drove yourself and... You got dressed and you did all of that, but God is wanting to know, did you stop for a moment to tell me thank you? I know you went to sleep last night and you thought that you were controlling your own breathing. You thought you just opened your eyes on your own. It was your power and your strength. But that breath in your lung, I'm gonna tell you something, who put it there? It's the one Jesus. And he wants to know, have you, when was the last time you told him, thank you, Lord? To live a life that is thankful, you have to choose to see the things you are to be thankful for. The story could have ended at the close of verse 14. Jesus healed them. They were cleansed. That's common. That's what Jesus did. He went around and he healed people. We read that all the time. Except for verse 15. Verse 15 is what convicts all of us. 
because not only did he receive the healing but he had to do something with what he received God is asking us to do something with that which he has given us the blessings the goodness the outpour of his grace and his mercies in our lives and he wants us to do something with that this is why this one guy this one leper shakes all of us up in this room because it points the finger at us this leper came back and gave the Lord thanks he not only saw it but he had to say it Jesus is looking for hearts that are thankful that are thankful, that are remembering to praise him, that are remembering to give him adoration for all that he has done in and through their lives. But it's not enough to see it. It's not enough to say it. We have to show our thanksgiving unto the Lord. Have you heard about this Jesus? The one who can not only heal lepers, but heal your broken heart. This Jesus who can make old things new, the one who can turn situations around, even though society and people will say it can't be done. But the lesson that you should grab from this message today is that, be like that one leper who went back and said, thank you. That's the one who was not just healed, but made whole. Before a breakthrough, there is always a battle. Before a move of God, before your circumstances change, the enemy will always try to get you to quit. And he will do what he can to either discourage your faith or to distract your focus. And he does this so that you may never see your miracle or your breakthrough. But here's what I'd like you to know today. I want you to expect and raise your faith that there is an appointment with God for your life to change. There is an encounter with the Lord that is scheduled to remove every stronghold of the enemy over your life. There is a date that has been set, a time that has been set, a divine appointment for things in your life to turn around for you. But in order to meet this appointment, you have to keep pressing on. Don't give up now. Keep believing God for a change. Keep believing God for a breakthrough. In fact, I want you to know that before promotion comes, persistence is needed. Persistence is needed in your faith. Persistence is needed in your praise. You have to be persistent with God in your prayer life. And maybe you can relate to this, but have you ever noticed how the enemy attacks you when you decide to get real with God? At the point that you decide in your heart to throw up your hands and surrender to God, when you decide to give him your all and you repent from your sins, you give him your fears and your concerns, the devil takes notice and he then begins to attack and that's where he begins to throw things that may distract your focus, discourage your faith, or make you question God's timing. And he does this because he knows that if you persist, then your breakthrough is just around the corner. You need to know that this is the battle before the breakthrough. You can't give up now. You have to, it says, encourage yourself in the Lord, even if it appears that everyone is against you. It says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, it says, God says, I'll raise up a standard. I'll raise up a standard. What is a standard? You are the standard. That came into my spirit one time when I was reading that scripture, and I about shouted all across my living room. Because some of you, you've been waiting on God for a long time. But what if I told you that you need to stop waiting on God because God's waiting on you? What if I told you today that you're one step of faith away from a whole new life? What if I told you today, if you can't believe it, he has the power enough to do it. Believe the unbelievable. 
and receive the impossible. Because everything that God has for you as a child of God, it is doable. It is available. You can do it if you have the faith enough to believe it. I told you, speak to the mountain. And it what? It has to be removed. I've said this so many times, but it never gets old to me. It says, it's, uh, you know, it says, speak to the mountain and it has to be removed. Samuel, it does not say climb up the mountain. Some of you, you've been climbing a mountain you should have been speaking to a long time ago. You've been climbing something, trying to do it yourself for a long time. You've been trying to fix the family. You've been trying to fix the finances all by yourself. You've been trying to fix the business all by yourself. You've been trying to fix things in your mind, in your spirit, in your heart, all by yourself. When you need to let go and let God have his way in your life. Because that is, that is a big reason why when we come into the house of God, or even if you're at your home, there's a big reason why I ask you or when I talk to you and tell you to lift your hands. Because there's something about when you lift your hands. When you lift your hands, it is a sign of surrenderance saying, God, I can no longer control the situation. Now you have to come and you have to work it out for me. Because if I try to do it by myself, I'd mess it up. If I tried to do it all by myself, I wouldn't be able to make it. But if I just lift my hand and say, God, I can't do it by myself. But as the song says, I know a man who can. I know a man that can walk on water. I know a man that can heal the sick. I know a man that can raise the dead. I know a man that can cast the, cast the sickness out of lepers. I know a man that is seated at the right hand of the Father. I know a man that is interceding for me each and every day. I know a man that they put on a cross. I know a man that they put nails in his hands and a crown of thorns on his head. I know a man that is blood dripped and shed on Calvary for the atonement and for the price of my sins. I know a man that they put inside of a grave expecting him to never get out and I know a man that they rolled the tomb they rolled the stone and I know a man that rose on the third day and if he is alive and I know that he is there is nothing that he cannot do there's no sickness that he cannot cure and for some of us the breakthrough that we are waiting on the Lord for is one that the enemy is afraid of there is nothing that the Lord Jesus cannot do. There is no area in your life that God cannot touch. And we all need a breakthrough in some part, in some area of our lives. But to get that, we are going to have to fight for peace. We are going to have to fight for that breakthrough. We will have to press on and be persistent you are going to have to settle in your heart that God is in control and you trust that he will help you to achieve this breakthrough. Now get this, one of the ways for you to get your breakthrough is through pushing, praising until something happens. Praise God until something happens. P-U-S-H, praise until something happens. I feel the Holy Ghost in here today. You have to push. You have to praise until something happens. What is praise? Praise is an action also known as a verb. It is something that you do. So in other words, with no praise or action, there is no breakthrough because you got to understand something. Praise unlocks your faith and faith activates your blessing. There is something powerful when you begin to praise God in the midst of perplexity and so now what is faith I said it once i'm gonna say it again faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen so in other words praise god for it's not about what you don't see yet but for what you, but for what you know that he is about to do and i i believe it is by faith that we live daily and i believe it's time for some people in this room today you may be looking at a situation you may be looking at a storm you may be looking at a difficulty but there comes a moment in your life where you stop telling god how big your problem problem is and you start looking your problem in the face and you tell it how big your God is because it's time to push towards what you want God to do to push towards your goals to push past how you feel to push every single demonic attack out of the way because failure is not an option when you push with God behind you 
when we serve God. Failure is not an option. You have to push and praise until something happens. In other words, before the door opens, you got to shout in the hallway. Before I, that's a prophetic word for somebody today. Before God even opens the door, you got to thank him for what he's about to do. You got to thank him for the family that's about to be saved. You got to thank him for the finances that are on the way. You got to thank him for the business that's going to succeed. You got to thank him for the peace that's going to hit your life. You got to thank him for the healing that's going to hit your body. You got to thank him for the doctor's report that is changing. You have to thank him for things you can't even see in the natural because all things work together for the good of them. That I love and believe in his name there is nothing I'm trying to get this into your spirit into your heart into your mind today there is nothing that God cannot do absolutely nothing there is nothing he can get you out of the courtroom he can pick you up at the doctor he can step into your family members when they're addicted and they're lost he can do it if you believe it he can do it if you believe it and I believe today if God has brought you where you are you have to know that God is going to take care of it he's going to pull you through that thing you have to remind yourself in tough times that God made you for this because he said I would never put anything on you that you cannot handle and that you cannot bear you have to stand strong on his word because this word is a rock this word is a foundation you have to live by this book you have to make decisions by this book you have to lead by this book learn from this book lead your family by this book pay your bills by this book you have to learn everything this book has because it says in this book the signs wonders and miracles are in the whole Holy Spirit is still alive and it is for today and we have to live out what is inside of this book it's not a storybook it's not here to make you feel good but it tells us the promise if you want to know God's will in your life open this book in the book of James the Bible says you do not have because you do not ask and in Matthew 17 verse 19 to 20 when the disciples asked Jesus why they could not cast out a demon, he responded saying, Because of your little faith. For I truly say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. So now here are a few questions. How many breakthroughs are we missing out on because we do not ask God for them? Or we do not persist in waiting on God long enough for the breakthroughs to manifest? How many breakthroughs are we missing out on because our expectation is so small? Our faith is so small that when we pray it results in nothing. You see God has given us a great invitation. He tells us to come and ask, to ask in faith and to keep asking in faith until we receive his answer. So in your own life, do not lose heart, do not give up, pray and keep praying until God grants you the breakthrough that you seek. And it's not enough just to simply pray about something, we need to pray with faith and confidence that our good Father will reward us when we diligently seek Him. You have to be persistent because you never know when you're on the edge of an appointed time for a breakthrough. You may have been in God's waiting room for some time now and let me tell you, if you're praying don't stop now. If you're praising don't stop now. Waiting can be painful at times because it reminds us that we aren't in control and that it is impossible for us to change some circumstances on our own. And at this point, this is where your back is against the wall and you realize that we need the Lord to move on our behalf. 
we can't get ourselves out of some situations. We can't heal ourselves. We can't give ourselves peace. But they who wait upon the Lord. The Bible is true when it says their strength will be renewed. And above all, we have faith and confidence that God will show up. Jesus always shows up. And it's not usually in our way or in our timing. But he has promised to never leave us or forsake us. And he never ignores us. Lately, I've found myself praying for things that money can't buy. My prayer requests have been, God will you give me peace of mind? Lord will you take my worry and my anxiety away? Father protect me, protect me every time I leave my home, protect my health. Every single one of my prayer requests have been for things that money cannot buy. And I have been trying to make sense of this year so far because 2020 has been a strange year. We all had plans, I'm sure. Plans that have either been disturbed or now delayed for one reason or another. But one thing that I have been learning and coming to understand is Proverbs 19 verse 21, where it says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. So I am coming to understand that my plans will not have any success unless God governs them all. Life is full of changes and challenges, but even those changes and challenges, God governs them all. We should not be doing a thing without God's counsel having approved it. So now as I begin to not just understand that it's God's plan that governs things in my life, I begin to have faith that if Jesus can turn the cold heart of a man who used to hunt Christians, if he can turn Saul, the persecutor, to Paul the Apostle, then he can change me from being weak in my mind to being strong. He can change me from being just someone on this earth to become someone significant for his kingdom. I begin to have faith because if Jesus discovered a woman at the well and then he gave her living water, then he can do it for me too. He can give me more faith instead of fear. He can give me more peace instead of worry, more joy instead of sadness. If Jesus can feel the touch of a desperate believer on the hem of his garment, then surely he can feel my pain. He can feel the weight that I am carrying. God has a plan for your life and a plan for my life. And we can choose to abide by his plan or we can try and go against it and do what we want to do. But the problem in doing our own thing or following our own plan is that we will have to face the consequences alone. And I would rather follow God's plan than do my own thing without God's counsel. So now the question becomes my plan or God's plan. You see, when it comes to God's plans, we act in faith when there is no guarantee or certainty. And for some of us, it's difficult when it comes to the things of God, but we do this all the time in our normal daily living. For example, no one knows what kind of a life a child will have, yet people continue to have children. No one can know how life will turn out with your spouse, yet we continue to have faith that our marriage will last a lifetime. But here's why sometimes it can be difficult or scary to follow God's plan. Believing in God always requires action before manifestation. Faith acts before anything happens. In Exodus 14 verse 16, Moses had to lift up his rod and stretch out his hand over the sea first before it divided. 
he never got to the Red Sea and it was already parted. It took faith in action for him to get there. And it took faith in action again for him to lift up his rod, stretch out his hand, before the miracle happened. Think of the woman with the issue of blood. Did she know that she would be healed? Did she know that if she pushed past that crowd, if she crawled and squeezed past everyone, did she know that she could get to Jesus? And if so, why not go to touch the hand of Jesus? Why just the hem of his garment? She was close enough already to touch the man. Why not grab him and pull on his garment to get his attention? I believe that her faith knew that just the action of touching something on Jesus would be more than enough for her to be healed. That's why in Luke 8 verse 48, Jesus responded saying, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Faith acted before anything happened. So you should be believing today. But you should also be acting on your belief. You should have faith today. But you should also be acting on your faith. And it can be as simple as speaking something out loud. For someone who needs to say this, say it out loud, I am healed, I am debt free, I am good enough, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Combine your faith with action because the word of God teaches us that faith is the key to everything for a believer in Christ. It's by faith that we come to accept Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. It's also by faith that we live our lives with the joy and gladness knowing that there is eternity to be spent with the Father above. And perhaps one of the most prominent verses in the Bible about faith is Hebrews 11 verse 6. Without faith it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And this underlines just how faith is a requirement for us as believers. It's the core of our Christian living. Imagine a court of law for example. There will always be a number of things that each party will have to prove in order to persuade the court to find a case in their favour. These so-called things that I've mentioned is the evidence that needs to be presented. It's evidence that persuades the judge and the jury to come to a decision. And so the Bible tells us in Hebrews 11 verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And that's the key part. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Faith is us presenting our belief, our evidence to the Lord and saying that we trust you. And we trust that you reward those who diligently seek you. So ask yourself, how strong is my evidence? How strong is my faith? Does my faith please the judge? Is the evidence of faith that I am presenting to the Lord enough for me to get this answer, for me to get this breakthrough? Do I believe beyond all reasonable doubt that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him? Another aspect of faith that we need to be aware of is the power that it can bring. Hebrews 11 verse 30 says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down. So the Bible is telling us that faith can break down walls. Faith can break down strongholds. So for the believer that needs a breakthrough, what do they need to have? What precedes the breakthrough? Faith. For the believer that needs a miracle, what precedes that miracle? Faith. For the one who has been seeking healing, 
or seeking peace and restoration in their lives, what precedes that? It's faith. Faith is not just something by which we enter into a right relationship with God. Faith is something that we should live with and exercise every single day. Faith should be the core principle that we stand on. Faith in God's word, faith in who God is and faith in his promises. So have faith.